you will turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. That's where we'll begin our study this evening, 1 Samuel chapter 3. We began discussing this morning some encouragement as the school year begins for our students and for parents. And what we're going to focus on uh, this evening is helping us to prepare ourselves as parents and grandparents that we can have influence and train as God would have us to do. What's the worst thing that could happen to your children? The, the worst possible thing that you could think of? Uh, you might think for your children or grandchildren, you might think, well, some sort of illness or disease that comes about. And no doubt that would be uh, horrible for us to consider. Uh, it happens from time to time to some, and, and it's just something we don't want to consider. So maybe that would be, you say, that's the worst thing that could happen to my kids or grandkids. You might say, well, they, they turn out to be a criminal, a hardened criminal, and that's, that's the life that they choose to lead. And, and if they head down that path, that's the absolute worst thing that could happen to my kids or grandkids. Well, 1 Samuel chapter 3 and in verse 13, it says, For I have told him that I'm about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew. So talking about Eli and his sons. And so what the Lord is saying here, he says, I'm going to judge him because there was something going on in his home and he knew about it. Notice the rest of the verse. Because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. He knew there was a problem. Eli is a judge over Israel and yet he does nothing about it. It's terrible of a thing to think of about illness that our kids may have or disease or if they turn out to a life of crime or something else horrible that we might can think about we're the people of God and we need to recognize that the worst possible thing that can happen is to have a, a situation like this to where we don't train our children the way God would want us to do so turn back if you will to the book of Judges and you know Judges it begins right where the book of Joshua ends off. And at the end of Joshua, you have this wonderful way of which they say, we're going to serve God, we're going to put him first, and that is our ultimate goal for us and our house. That's the way Joshua puts it. But in Judges, you see it begin off a little bit that way, and then by the time you get to chapter 2, and in verse 10, you find that generation passes. And as that generation passes and they are all gathered to their fathers the way that the writer puts it, there arises another generation after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which the Lord had done for Israel. And so we might think this, this is the absolute worst. And I don't disagree with that. That a generation would come that has no idea about God. That hasn't prepared themselves for service to them and has no reverence for our Creator. We probably all know someone that way. Maybe someone in our family that, that they were focused on serving God, but their kids, that it just doesn't seem to take hold, if you will. And then a generation passes, and once was a generational family of maybe focus on God's will and focus on His service and trying to do what He wants them to do, turns to people that have no idea who God even is. It's hard to imagine what happens here in Judges chapter 2, really, because they had just conquered the land of Canaan, not by their own strength or military prowess, but because God was guiding them, and he gave them the victory. And yet you think people that first-handedly experienced that surely would pass that on to their kids and would teach that to their kids, and yet they fall wearily down this path of their children and the next generation having no idea who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is. How does that happen? How does it happen that someone doesn't know and that it doesn't pass along and information doesn't pass along? Well, that just happened in Judges, right? That's not something for us. I've been working through a book for several years, haven't finished it. I've got other books that I like to read, and this book's called Already Gone, uh, it's written by Ken Ham and Brent uh, Beamer is his name. You'll know Ken Ham probably because he's the one that's 
in charge of that big ark that they built in, uh, in Kentucky. And they did some research. This is some of the things that he found out from the Barna Group in this particular book. It says 61% of today's young adults, now this is 2009, 2010 when the book was published, so it's already 15 years old. 61% of today's young adults who were regular church attendees are now spiritually disengaged. They're not actively attending church, praying, or reading their Bibles. He goes on with more statistics, says 20% of those who were spiritually active during high school are, are maintaining a similar level of commitment. In other words, 80% that were spiritually active in high school are not. 19% teens were, that were never reached by the Christian community and are still disconnected from the church or any other Christian activities. There's one research that he points to. I want to look at a couple more from this book where he says this is from Lifeway, and they quote it there in the same book, uh, but this was done by the Southern Baptist Convention. They were trying to figure out what was going on, and so he quotes their research where he says more than two-thirds of young adults who attended a Protestant church of at least a year in high school stopped attending for at least a year between the ages of 18 and 22. Goes on to try to answer some questions. As you know, he focuses on uh, his work in, in creation and, and having the evidence that's needed for that. And he says, that these are the statistics for this particular question that he and the co-author put together. Those who no longer believe that all the accounts and stories of the Bible are true, of those, 39.8% first had doubts in middle school. 43.7% had doubts in high school. Friends, that's 83.5%. They start doubting before they ever leave home about whether or not they can even trust the Bible. Another 10.6% begin to doubt in college. If we think that the account in Judges or the account in 1 Samuel chapter 3 is just some old story, that that just happened to those, but it'll never happen to my family. It'll never happen to my kids. We'll take a seat and listen. Because it's happening every day and it's far too common that people have no idea about who God is, even though they may have attended a church regularly or had parents or grandparents who were believers in God. The statistics truly are just staggering and startling to look at. And so when we think about our kids, and I think about my two kids, and you think about your kids and your grandkids, what are we going to do? Because these sort of pieces of information scream out that there it has to be something that we can do to stop this to help them to build their faith on evidences and facts to know for without a doubt that this is truth and that it can it, it can be what they rely upon for their entire lives in eternity what are we going to do about concerns such as this a new group arises in judges chapter 2 and they don't know the lord how are we going to solve that problem? I want to just ask you to consider for a few minutes tonight this principle that's given in Proverbs 22. Not an absolute truth. You need to know that when you read the book of Proverbs. That Proverbs are general truths. And as you read something like Proverbs 22 and in verse 6, one that you're, I'm convinced, well familiar with, that the general truth that the Lord gives to us here is that Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I say it's generally true, as the Proverbs are, because it is entirely possible and happens frequently where someone who is not trained as a child comes to know God and serves him fervently. And one that is trained as a child does reject it. And there's plenty of scriptural evidence for both of those. But the general truth that he puts here is that for the most part, if we will train our children how they should go, what they should do, and how they should live, that they will commit their lives to the same truth, that they will be instilled in that truth. And he says it in this way. He says you have a responsibility to train. And that's probably the word here in this text that we have the most familiarity with because we recognize that we can train our dogs. 
We recognize we could train a horse or some other kind of animal. And the idea is when I train my dog, I, I want him to have a certain set of characteristics or to do certain things based upon circumstances. And so to get them to do what I want them to do takes training. And by training them, you can get that dog or that horse or whatever animal it is to obey you. You know, your kids and grandkids are a lot smarter than your dog. And they're a lot more intelligent than any other animal. They're brilliant. But they can be trained. They can be taught. And that's the way that the proverb is put here. They can learn how to live and learn how to make choices that are proper. And learn how to serve God. From early on as a children, they're taught to live. And they're taught to live as a child. The infant knows and quickly learns. When there's a problem and they cry, you will respond. We sometimes think, well, then they're training us. The fact of the matter is, that cannot be the case. Yes, we need to know when something's wrong, and so we respond to certain situations. But the fact is, from the very beginning, we start in some capacity based upon age and maturity to train our children to do something. And what we want to be doing is training them how to live life properly. We turn it to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. The chapter begins after a chapter of admonitions to husbands and wives. The chapter begins to children. And it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so it may be well with you, may live long on the earth. And then he turns his attention specifically to the training. And he says, fathers, not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Yours may say the training and admonition of the Lord. And so you see these two things are connected. The way that you are to bring them up and the way that they are to learn then is, is connected between this training and discipline, this discipline, this instruction. That's the idea that he's talking about here. That fathers, your job is to train your kids and to give them the instruction that they need. Dads, we've got to be leaders in the family. We've got to embrace the role that God had for us. That it's our responsibility to lead and to be the spiritual guidance that our family needs. And that training begins immediately after they're born their communication with crying. But there comes to a point where they won't be doing that. And we're going to need to be training them as a parent and not letting them train us because ultimately that is sometimes what happens. Our job, fathers, is to lead in this training process. But we know there's more to it than that. If you consider back to our text in Proverbs 22, just the verse right before this Proverbs 22, in, or just after, excuse me, Proverbs 22, I'm looking down in verse 15. In Proverbs 22 and in verse 15, it says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. The responsibility we have in training our kids is to help them to make right decisions. They need instruction. They need guidance. They don't come fully ready to face on the world and fully ready to not make bad decisions. They need to be taught. Not based upon what culture or society says, but based upon what they need. We saw when we read this morning in Proverbs chapter 1 that this instruction given to kids is not just something that comes from fathers. Though fathers are to lead the family. But it is something included with the mother's instruction. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. Hear my son your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed they are graceful wreath on your head and ornaments around your neck. The training of the family is mothers and fathers working together. If, if we don't work together in training our kids... Our kids will pit us against one another. Our children need to know that mom and dad are on the same team. And they are working to train the children. 
It is not mom allows this and dad allows that. We should not allow our kids to when they're told no from mom to run and ask dad just to get a yes. We're on the same team. We support one another in that training together for the betterment of our children. There's a lot of psychology in the world and a lot of things that are thought amongst what's taught in society. And they say, well, the things that the Bible says about this training are, are old and archaic and they really don't fit today. But I'm not really concerned with what society has to say about how to train children. And I'm not really concerned with what culture dictates when it comes to training children. I just want to know what does God want me to do in training our children. The idea about this has changed, but you know what? Kids are still kids. Technology's changed. I get that. But kids are still kids. And they still need training just the same as they did when we were kids. Just the same as when generations ago they were kids. They still need the same training. What does God want us to do? And what he wants are mothers and fathers leading these kids and training these kids. They want fathers taking the lead and mothers working together with fathers as we go about this instruction that is of the ultimate importance to our kids. Look with me in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. This, this is not something that I'm advocating for this to be done so that I have some sort of bad relationship with my kids or because I, I'm trying to just see how rough I can make it on them and I'll make them tough so that life will be better for them later on and they'll really appreciate life. That's not what we're trying to do. That's not what discipline is. Discipline is this guidance and training that children need. And in Revelation chapter 3, I just want you to notice that this idea that Jesus is instructing to the, the churches, we'll take this, this understanding from here. He says in verse 19, Revelation 3, he's trying to correct and reprove these churches. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. He loved those churches. He loved the people that make up those churches. That's what he's talking about. And because he loved them, he offered reproof and rebuke and discipline. We are to train our kids because we love them. Because that's what they need most. And sometimes it, it's, it's hard to discipline. I know I'm talking to people that have grandkids, somehow great grandkids. I, I get that. And you understand that it's difficult at times in disciplining our kids. It's, it's difficult because it pulls at our heartstrings. But the end of the day is I want what's best for them. They may not understand it at the time. But the training that we give them is not to make them upset and not to, you know, to discount self-esteem or anything like that. We're trying to guide them and discipline them because we love them. Just the same idea that Jesus is telling here to these churches as he goes on reproving them. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse uh, 6, it's put this way, Hebrews 12, and in verse 6, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and he scourges every son whom he receives. God's disciplining of us is because of his love for us. That's why it's to be carried out. And the way that he does it is because he loves us. We delight in our kids. We want what's best for them. And if we want what's best for them, they need to be disciplined. They need to be taught. And they need to be instructed. Back to Proverbs chapter 3 and in verse 11 and 12. Proverbs 3 and verse 11. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his re reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves. Even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Kids may not understand it. Your grandkids may not understand it. But when we are training them, they're upset about it. You can tell them, I'm, I'm doing this for your good. I'm doing this because of my love for you. I'm telling you no because I want what's best for you. And 
and I'm guiding you because I love you. That must be understood. That it's not my wrath and it's not my anger that's disciplining a child. But my love for them. That I want what's best for them. We need to teach our kids the proper training of their emotions. The proper training of their choices. And where love is the driving force and discipline, it will produce righteousness to get the individual closer to where they need to be. Instead of closer to anger. This is about love and not wrath. And therefore, we have to recognize what he says in Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse 4, where this training that he discusses there for fathers is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see that discipline's part of it, but discipline has to be accompanied with instruction. It must be included. If you're still in Proverbs, turn to chapter 22. And consider this verse. We've already uh, read in Revelation chapter 3 this same idea. But just consider it in Proverbs 22 and in verse 15. Where this foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. That is, you're, you're taking this thing that's in them that is incorrect. And the discipline is helping them to learn from it. And to get far from it, if you will. That's the idea that he talks about. Children have to understand the connection between discipline and instruction. It's correcting your son. When your kids or your grandkids are, are walking around the, the stove at home and they reach up to touch you and you tell them no and you may move them away from it in some form or fashion. Are you doing that because you dislike them? Or are you correcting and instructing them because there's a potential for their harm? Which is it? What if I have to I have to move them out of the way? They may take that wrong, but I, I don't want them to burn themselves, and so I'm going to instruct them as to what they need to do so that they will be safe. And so we tell them no. There comes a point where discipline must happen. But when discipline happens, it must also be accompanied with instruction. It's not just, I'm going to give out some discipline to my kids, but it is, I'm going to let them know why. I'm going to let them know what the correct action should be so that they understand what my expectations are. I put Isaiah chapter 38 up there. That's Hezekiah. In, uh, after praying to the Lord, the Lord answers his prayer. And, and look at the way this is put. I find this, this and the next one just interesting. Isaiah 38 and verse 19. He says, It is the living who give thanks to you as I do today. A father tells his sons about your faithfulness. So he speaks of how a father talks to his children about God. We have to teach our children about who God is. And we have to teach them about what God wants from them. We're dealing with righteousness and how the Lord wants us to live. And the instruction is by example. The other verse I've got here in my notes is Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 44. Ezekiel 16 and verse 44. This is speaking of Jerusalem and the fact that they were not following God. Ezekiel 16 and verse 44. He says, Behold, everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb concerning you, saying, Like mother, like daughter. Did you know that was in the scripture? And the way that he's putting that here is he's saying, well, well, we would say it like this. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. However you want to put it, that is, he is teaching the lesson to Israel. And the kids follow the example of the the instruction can be accompanied with discipline, but you know our kids are always learning from us. And they're always watching. The children of Israel just follow in the footsteps of their parents. And, and kids are going to learn from what we do. They're going to know what was important to daddy. They're going to know what was important to mama. And they're going to pattern their lives the way that you live more than anything. They're going to pattern the way that they act 
based upon how you act. It's interesting to think about, but if you'll be honest about it, you probably act like your parents. Those who had the greatest impact on you in those formidable years. I'm fortunate. You probably are too. So take that with the knowledge that it is. Fathers, your children are watching you. They're learning from you. They're seeing what dad thinks is right. They're seeing how to be a good husband, or they're seeing the kind of husband they should search for in their mate. Mothers, our children are following after you. They're seeing how you and your husband interact with one another. They're watching, they're listening, and they're going to follow what you do probably more than what you say. They're going to follow your action. Are, are we, you know, if we're a function of our parents, we are. Uh, personalities are, are certainly right along with it. Our likes and our dislikes. I don't eat seafood. You ask, why don't I eat seafood? My dad doesn't. That, frankly, that's the only reason. It's not because I tasted it and disliked it. I may have had some at one point in time. But we learn from our parents. And we mimic the things that they do. They're a reflection on us. So be careful about the example that you give spiritually. Because the things in which we do in service to God are a lot more important than whether or not you eat seafood. Understand the power of the example that you have with your children and with your grandchildren. And then finally, Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23 and in verse 13 and 14. Proverbs 23 and verse 13 and 14. It says, Do not hold back discipline from the child, although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. You shall strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. Here's the point I want us to understand. The goal that we're trying to do is to help our kids, discipline our kids, not to withhold the correction that they need, but to direct their soul away from hell. And our goal with our kids is saving their souls. We want them to have a good life. We want them to learn how to function in society. I'm not discounting that or trying to say anything to the negative about it. But I want my children more than anything else in this world to serve God for eternity. I want them to be in heaven, and I want them to know the God that loves them. And, the, and the, the God that loved them so much to offer his son for their salvation. The training and the discipline that our children receive and the instruction in the Lord has to have the ultimate goal of saving their souls. So teach them about that reality. And teach them about that truth. And if they're going down a certain direction in life, guide them away from that direction. Bring them back to serving correctly. Bring them back from spiritual destruction because you love them. Because you love them enough to where you recognize where they're going wrong and you don't want them to end up hurt there. We read 2 John verse 4 this morning in our scripture reading. I want you to consider it here as we bring our lesson to a close. 2 John in verse 4. He's talking here, and it says in verse 1, to the chosen lady and her children. I, I'm not convinced, kind of like we talked about in our lesson this morning, that this is talking about a physical mother and her children. Maybe, but it is talking about one who has this guidance over others. And so he says in verse 4, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. That's what we're trying to do. That our children and those that we have an impact and influence on will be found walking in truth. When they're grown, when they're living on their own, when they're making their own choices, they have their own faith, their own relationship with God, they understand who God is, they understand the result of sin, and then they live the life of righteousness. They live in truth. They're walking in truth in the way that they choose to live their lives. We can't live the lives for our children. We can't make their choices for them all of their years. That's not possible for us. We can certainly guide and train them 
so that they will be how God would have them to be. I know I said that was the last verse, but I got one more. I'll just and I'll close with this in Proverbs chapter 19. Whereas parents and grandparents, well, just all of us, we ought to go home and read the book of Proverbs. It is the lesson book for how to train and bring up your children. Proverbs 19 and verse 18. He says, "Discipline your son while there's hope." Because there will come a time we won't have that opportunity. It may be when we pass or it may be when they turn away and come up with their own way about living life. But we've got a shot. We've got an opportunity. It doesn't really matter how old they are. It's never too late to start. Talk to your kids, even if they're adults, about how to serve the Lord. If you haven't been focusing on that with your teenagers, I implore you, start today. It can be done. Begin working, focusing on what God would have you do in your family. Don't let them train you. You train them with the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Thank you for your attention today. I had good, I've just been so impressed with your good attention in this morning's lesson and in this evening. And I pray both of these are encouragements to us all, as they've been an encouragement to me as I've worked in preparing them for you. Let us seek to serve the Lord and our families and live how He would want us to live. We're going to sing a song of encouragement at this time as an invitation to you that if we can assist you in your service to the Lord in a public manner, we would like to take advantage of that while we're all gathered here this evening. We can offer up prayers for you if we'd like to do that, or if we can help you by putting Christ on in baptism. Take advantage of the time that you have. Let us know how we can help as we stand together. As we stand. Oh, well.